Sweden opted against a lockdown when it came to measures against spreading COVID-19. Observers watched the country closely to see whether enough of the population would eventually become immune to the disease. The strategy has arguably led to one of the highest per capita death tolls in Europe, calling into question the Scandinavian country's decision. Six months into the pandemic, it's still unclear when those infected with the coronavirus really are immune and for how long. One recent study shows steep drops in patient antibody levels within months of getting COVID-19. So just how long would it take to be reinfected with the coronavirus? Welcome to your COVID-19 special here on DW News. I'm Monica Jones. Good to have you with us. Now, of course, we all want to be immune to SARS-CoV-2. We could go about our lives without worrying about getting infected or infecting others. And the key to our newly won freedom could be an immunity passport. But that's highly controversial. It could be embedded in a chip card an immunity ID that says the bearer has survived COVID-19 or been immunized, a contentious issue for political leaders. It creates a fatally false incentive to get infected deliberately in order to have more freedom afterwards. It also divides our society. I think the question of immunity has not yet been settled on a scientific level. Until it is, we cannot introduce something like this. I don't want to split the population into sick and healthy people. But Health Minister Jens Spahn doesn't want to let go of the idea, even in the face of opposition. There are fundamentally good arguments on both sides. On the one hand, many of our citizens feel a need to know if they've had COVID-19, and there will also be countries that will demand this kind of proof. So far, no country is seriously considering a compulsory immunity passport for incoming travellers. But Iceland has discussed making a fresh negative COVID-19 test a requirement for entry. Instead of a two-week quarantine, one can take a test at Reykjavik airport or provide a doctor's statement recognized by the Icelandic health ministry. A Cologne startup is already working on a digital COVID-19 passport that would use blockchain technology to store a negative test result for three days, the length of time before an infected person becomes contagious. You have to think about it like an aeroplane boarding pass that shows a fresh COVID-19 test result, which indicates that I don't have the virus now. Then I can always have it ready, I keep it in my pocket, so I can decide myself whether or not to show it and to whom. We're not going to stop people from getting tested at their own expense, but we can stop them from using that to their advantage in our society to do things that others cannot. People could have their test results and immunity passports stored on their phones. But what difference would it make for nightclub or cinema operators, for example, if only a small percentage of Germany's 80 million plus population participates? Frankly, an immunity ID or passport would bring us no benefit. It would be so few people, not a single cinema could open up on that basis. Ethics experts fear that individual health data could become less and less private. Usually, it's my own decision to tell someone about the state of my health. That's one of my rights as an individual. But now, in the time of the pandemic, we see that there can be a justified public interest in finding out whether someone is sick or not. Health Minister Spahn wants more time for debate. It's too delicate a matter to be rushed. And for more, I'm joined by Professor Thomas Kamrat. He's the president of the German Society of Immunology and the director of the Institute of Immunology in Jena. Good to have you with us. Well, uh, listening to this report just now, I guess the big question is, are people who recover from COVID-19 immune to the disease? And does it therefore make sense to introduce an immunity ID? Well, the, the short answer to the first question is that most people will be immune for some time. And, and perhaps I'll elaborate a little bit on that and then we come to the second question. So um, 
millions of people have suffered from COVID-19 and until very recently there were no reports on uh, re-emergence of the disease. Until last week when a paper was published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases from Wuhan in China where uh, hospital workers followed people that had been ill with COVID-19, were cured, had been uh, released from the hospital and were followed up. And out of 600 such people, covalescent people, uh, some uh, were positive again on virus tests. That's not unexpected. But eight of these uh, were sick again, and some of these needed hospitalization. That is to say that a small percentage in the range of 1% of people who have recovered from the disease may be reinfected very soon after they have recovered. So an immunity ID doesn't really make sense when I, uh, when I listen to that answer. Before we uh, elaborate on that, uh, first let's establish what our immune system is actually doing because it's our very own defense mechanism against intruders. So uh, let's take a look what happens when an unwelcome guest, in this case a virus, enters our body. When it's infected with the novel coronavirus, the body mounts an immune response. So-called antigen-presenting cells ingest proteins from the virus and display them on their surface. This activates T helper cells, which initiate a host of immune functions. They help activate cytotoxic T cells to kill already infected cells in the body. And they stimulate B cells to produce antibodies that bind to the virus, preventing it from infecting further cells and tagging it for destruction. Now, Professor Kamrad from the German Society of Immunology, uh, there have been cases where the immune system's reaction actually caused bigger problems than the virus itself. What do we know about uh, how COVID-19 accelerates the immune system? Um, COVID-19 COVID as a, uh, or SARS-CoV-2, the virus, uh, um, it's an alarm signal to the immune system. And in some cases, the immune system overreacts and then some of the cells that you just mentioned in, in your feature um, produce cytokines, uh, transmitters that communicate with other cells and set a very, very high uh, alarm, state of alarm. And that then contributes to lung failure, uh, similar to what has happened in some cases of influenza and other respiratory viruses like SARS. So the reaction to the virus can contribute to the severe form of the disease that we see in some of the patients. Right. Now, you've mentioned it earlier that there, uh, there are studies out now that say that it is possible uh, that once you've had COVID-19, you can get it again. And we've certainly seen several studies that show that antibody levels drop rather quickly. How big a role do T cells play then for our immunity? Uh, we know very little about T cells in the uh, defense against COVID-19, against COVID but we do know that they're extremely important for other respiratory viruses. So we can assume that they are also important for SARS-CoV-2. And we know from SARS, the, the earlier variant of uh, the SARS-CoV viruses, that T cells that uh, um, are detectable in the mucosal, in the respiratory tract, are much more long-lived and probably more important than the antibody responses in these patients. So the T cells are extremely important to protect us against respiratory viruses like SARS-CoV-2. And just very briefly, yes or no? Immunity ID, yes or no? Uh, no. Okay, Professor Kamrad, President of the German Society for Immunology, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Goodbye. And now let's hear more of your questions. Our science correspondent Derek Williams stands ready to give some answers. What's being done to establish the actual origin of the virus? Chasing a novel pathogen uh, back to its original source is an extremely complex but, but also a very important task because it provides uh, invaluable information about, about how to prevent similar events in the future. Um, the current mantra is still that SARS-CoV-2 jumped from animals to humans uh, sometime towards the end of last year in China. But we still don't know much about where or how. Uh, we know that genetically it looks quite similar to other coronaviruses found in bats, but, but we can't yet say whether it jumped directly to us from them or if there were other intermediate host animals. Um, 
China has come in for criticism worldwide in, in the course of this crisis, not least for its perceived lack of, of transparency and cooperation in, in looking into the origins of SARS-CoV-2. Um, but, but finally, last week, the WHO announced it was sending an advance team there to help coordinate the search um, into how the COVID-19 crisis began. Uh, it's made up of just two of the organization's experts, but I mean, I guess you have to start somewhere. Um, a larger international mission is supposed to follow, but there doesn't appear to be a concrete timeline yet for, uh, for when. Has anyone tested the fertility of those who have recovered from COVID-19? Lots of researchers are, are looking into this topic. Um, a quick search for the terms COVID-19 and fertility in, in 2020 academic publications uh, threw up 4,000 hits. Uh, I looked at, at several of those that had been most cited, and, and they all had one thing in common. They said, uh, we don't really know yet. Um, a quite recent study, though, from researchers in Oxford that, among other things, uh, looked closely at receptors associated with the virus in reproductive system tissue from both men and women, um, it came to the cautious conclusion that, at the cellular level at least, uh, COVID-19 doesn't appear to do any lasting damage or be associated with increased risk of complications uh, that might affect fertility. But the discussion, of course, included the caveat that we, we still don't have enough data to say anything for certain. 